What's up guys? So today per request, I'm going to go through what a typical warm up or prep looks like for me. And I'm going to do it for a leg day because let's be honest, uh, leg day is cooler than all the other days. Uh, and also I think that there's an argument to be made for you have a lot of stuff going on for lower body. So if you really want to take your time with a warm up or a prep, this is the time to do it. Um, so before I get into it, please do that YouTube thing, like subscribe. The channel is growing. You guys are doing a really good job. I appreciate everyone that takes time out to comment, to share and do all that good stuff. Um, so today I'm basically going to get right into it. And at the end of the video, I'm going to get a little bit more descriptive of why I think this is absolutely a great thing or a great practice for anyone to do. Uh, the disclaimer I'll do right now is do you have to do any of this? No. If you're really pressed for time and don't feel like it, um, the absolute best thing to still do before you train is just pyramid up. So if you're going to start with squats, do four, five, six sets of squats mindfully under control with intent and warm up. And that's still the best warm up. Um, so this is something that I do in combination with that. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to show you the individual warm ups, activations, preps, whatever you want to call them. Um, and in between each one, typically what I do is a warm up set. So that's how I do this to save time is I'll do what I'm going to do now very first then a warm-up set, then the next one, then a warm-up set. So in between each one of these, again, I'm not gonna show you all my warm-up sets, but just imagine me going and getting under a bar and doing four, five, six warm-up sets up to my very first set if I was gonna do like free weight squats or something. So again, I think it's a very efficient use of time and I want stuff that doesn't take a million years and something that I'll actually do consistent, uh, consistently. So, First one right in here is gonna be the feet. I'm gonna talk through it a little bit as we go. Now again, there could be an endless amount of things that you do, but these are the, some of the ones that I always start with. So the first things that I always start with feet is I'll just do some ankle circles. So just mindfully trying to take my ankles through their full range of motion, just pretty slow. And again, the number of reps, don't get too fixated on it. If stuff feels good, I might do three, four reps. So I'm gonna do two circles that way, and then I'll do two full circles. This way, I'm going to cut some of these short for you guys so you don't have to watch me do the whole deal. So that's typical, and then I'll do the same for the other side. I'll just do one each. So typically, I might do anywhere from two to three. And what I normally do is my right ankle moves better than my left ankle. So people always say, I have side-to-side -side imbalances. What do I do? This is a great way to start to address some stuff you can do yourself. So instead of doing, you know, I might do two that side, I might do three or four of this side. So if I have a side that doesn't move as well or doesn't feel as well, then typically I'll just take more time on that side. So I'll start with circles. Then normally I go to what's some version of pronation, supination. So basically you don't have to know that inversion, eversion, whatever you want to call the motion, but turning the feet this way. So same thing. I'll typically do two to three each way. I'll normally give them a little bit longer hold than that. So when I go into those end ranges, I'm holding. You don't have to know the names and the muscles. Couldn't matter less. Whatever you feel, just squeeze that. And then same thing for the other side, go to the end ranges, hold those muscles, squeeze, whatever it is. And again, one of the best practices you can do if you feel like you have side to side imbalances, like for me, typically my left ankle always feels like it's in a block of cement. So I'll generally take more warm up sets on that side. So once I do those, then I go right into basically what I call ankle bridges and then toe raises, anterior tip stuff. So for ankle bridges, this one I'm focused on getting my ankles towards the ceiling contract the calves as hard as I can. And then anterior tip stuff, hard squeeze here, wherever you feel the muscle contract and hold. And like I said, typically I'll do about anywhere from three to five of everything, two to five. Again, don't get too caught up on that. If you really feel great, same as any day, if your warm ups feel good, your body feels good, you're mentally in it, you can probably need less. You have some days when stuff just feels like it's moving a little slower, not moving as well take a little bit longer holds, a little bit longer squeezes, and maybe do a couple extra reps here and there. So that's the first one I always start with, some feet stuff, then I'll go do a warm up set, and then move on to the next one. All right guys, so typically I move into something next just to take my knee through its fully lengthened position, so full, I should say my quad through its fully lengthened position, take my knee into full knee flexion. And so one of the most unloaded ways to do this is just a front foot elevated, basically split squat variation. So I'll get a nice high box. Obviously you could use anything. It doesn't even need to be this high. Six inches, 12 inch box is all gonna be fine. Focus on driving that knee forward and then just hitting a little pause at the bottom. When I'm pausing here, I'm focused on keeping this tight. I'm focused on squeezing my anterior tibialis a little bit as well here too. So if some of you guys have ankle mobility issues, I think that combination starting with ankle stuff first and then going into this can be a great sequence because one, you're creating hopefully a little bit of mobility 
opening up those ankles a little bit, and then you're training it in a very similar pattern that you would be for a squat, especially a knee dominant squat, where you're asking your body to create a lot of dorsiflexion and you're also getting into full knee flexion. So typically would do anywhere from three to four each leg. I'm not gonna do all of them on this way. Again, make sure I'm getting my hamstrings smushed into my calf, generally squeezing that anterior to keeping the quads nice and tight. And again, just making sure everything feels good in that position. Oh, hey, didn't see you there. Come down on the floor with me, I'm already here. Um, so next two I tend to do are more for core stuff. I hate the word, but torso stuff. Um, and again, really all I'm trying to do with this is just get some good connection. So really make sure, can I actually control and kind of isolate a little bit that TVA feeling? Um, and then the second drill is gonna be, can I keep my torso still when stuff is moving and stuff is gonna wanna pull me out of that neutral spine? So I'll show you the very first one, probably just do two or three, but basically just what I would call belly breathing. So I like to first off, make sure your lower back is flat on the ground. So if, right here, I have a little bit of an arch. Just press that lower back into the ground. It's gonna be a little bit of a posterior pelvic tilt. And then from there, I'm focused on my belly button travel. So when I inhale, I try and pull my push my belly button towards the ceiling, as much air in my belly as I can. And then when I exhale, try and exhale through my nose and pull my belly button in towards the floor. I'm not gonna do a ton of those, but what you can't see is I'm trying to pull as close to the floor that I can. If you do that properly, you should feel a very strong contraction, that hard, crampy contraction feeling should be from your TVA is the main muscle that's doing that. And then I'm holding that for about five seconds. So when I actually feel that muscle, that's what I focus on. Of course, I focus on how close can I get my belly button to the spine and the floor, but also how hard can I hold that contraction? So same, let's do one more rep. And the big keys on that one as well too, is I'm not trying to move my spine. So there's no spinal flexion extension occurring. It's spine nice and still while I keep that belly button traveling as much as I can. The next one is a dead bug variation. And again, the challenge on this one is to keep my torso, so to keep all of my spine, keep my ribs and keep my pelvis still. So again, I like this one because it kind of ties in a lot of stuff. This will work more rectus abdominis, a little bit of TVA, even internal external obliques. So I'll demo one or two, and then I'll kind of tell you some of the things that I'm thinking about. So kind of start a little bit crunched up here. So I have my pelvis a little bit off the ground. I have my ribs up a little off the ground. It doesn't have to be in this position, but I like this because this loads rectus abdominis. Start here, and then I'm gonna alternate arm and leg. And so typically I'll do um, probably, I look at time more for that. I'll try and do that for 30 to 40 seconds, however many reps per side that works out to be. But I always say on that one, you're not training anything that moves your arms and your legs. Hopefully you can imagine, as I'm trying to keep all this still, as a leg goes out and an arm goes out, one, it's gonna try and pull my spine more into extension. So again, basically that's creating additional load by creating mar larger moment arms, again, to the pelvis and to the ribs. So it makes them want to move even more than they did before I was crunched up. And also the alternating creates this kind of rotation. So one wants to pull my pelvis this way and wants to pull my ribs this way. And so by keeping everything still, I'm actively contracting a lot of stuff. That's really how that crunch up and hold is gonna get rectus abdominis. Keeping that belly button in the same spot will get TVA. And then keeping your pelvis and stuff from rotating and twisting is gonna have internal external obliques, even QL involved just a little bit as well there too. So that's typically stuff where again, I'm gonna kind of recap this again, not magically activating anything, but bring mindfulness and control to some muscles that are obviously doing a lot of work when you're doing a lower body day, particularly if you're doing a squat or a deadlift pattern. I'm gonna get out typically do anywhere from three to five of each one. That second one looking a little bit more for time. And then obviously, like I said, in between all these, go in, hit another warm up set of my squats as I keep working on them. All right, guys. Um, and last two that I typically do here. So again, um, someone's gonna watch some of this and I'll recap this a little bit at the end, but this is not an all inclusive list. It's just some of the big stuff that I like to kind of just prep and kind of again, gain some awareness of before I go. You could always add things to this list for specific needs. You could always take things away, but I always think I've done, you know, ankles and feet are huge for squat patterns. Torso is huge, especially for doing squats or deadlifts. And then obviously I wanna look at what's going on at my hip joint as well too, because again, knees aren't quite as complex. I've already taken them kind of through their full range of motion and I'm gonna actually fully extend my knee with one of these as well too, but hips have a little bit more going on. So I wanna take them through some more extended range of motion as well too. So I'm gonna just demo one side here. So the first one that I do, you don't have to have a block. 
This just tends to work out pretty well for this one, but you could have anything I think to kind of press between your knees. You can even put a hand between your knees. Just something that you're giving yourself a little bit of room here. Let your pelvis move a little, excuse me, let your femur move in your pelvis a little bit more. And so the first one I'm doing here is isolated internal rotation at the hip. There's a whole bunch of ways to do this. This is just the way that I like to do it. That's pretty convenient. Um, and again, for me, not too much of a pain in the ass. So again, I'm focusing, just imagine my femur internally rotating inside my pelvis. So yes, I can look at my leg and my foot to kind of see where stuff ends up, but my focus is really deep, feeling that stuff in my pelvis moving. So again, I'm gonna internally rotate as far as I can. Once I get to that end range, I'm gonna focus on where I feel that deep in the hip. Hold for about three, four, five seconds, and then back down and then repeat. Take it all the way to the end range, hold, three, four, five seconds. And again, typically I'd repeat that for anywhere from three to five reps. And then for the next one, I'm gonna go external rotation. I just do the bottom leg here. So again, the big thing I always tell us is when you don't want your leg moving like this, same as it didn't move here into any sort of uh, hip flexion or hip extension, we just wanna isolate rotation. So again, here I'm imagining my femur just rotating or turning this way deep in the pelvis. So there shouldn't be much of this. So you can put a hand here. Some people like to put the block here as a little bit of a gauge to make sure that, again, that bone's not moving. Some tissue's gonna move around. So again, obviously my muscle's gonna move around a little bit, but I just really wanna visualize that bone staying still and then rotating this way is gonna be external rotation at the hip. So same thing, I can look at where the leg and the foot goes. That's a fine gauge, but I'm focusing on deep hip stuff and then down. And then typically I'm gonna do same thing, three to five reps, hold, focus on where I feel that, squeeze, three, four, five seconds, and then repeat one more time. And then when I was done, when I'd be done with this side, then I roll over and repeat the exact same process on the other side. So I'll stop with, start with the top leg on the other side, train internal rotation, then external rotation of the bottom leg. And once I've done that, the last one that I do is straight leg hip flexion. And I can make the argument with one, it's a nice way to fully shorten all the quads, get full knee extension going, but then also to really try and isolate the rec fem, which I can argue has a pretty good stabilizing purpose of the pelvis, you know, when you're doing some squatting stuff. So the sequence on this one I always do is flex the quad hard first, take the knee all the way straight, and then from there, keeping that knee straight, keeping the quad flexed hard, raise all the way up. Sometimes when I'm at my end range, I'll actually press into my hand a little bit, just for a little additional outside, you know, uh, demands of contraction, not hard. None of this is designed to be super challenging. And then each rep will set it all the way down, relax the knee, then fully extend the knee, fully flex the quad, and then repeat the process. You have other hip flexors, so by flexing that quad hard and keeping it straight as you raise up, you can arguably really be biasing that rec fem over other hip flexors. And like I said, one more. So fully extend the knee, flex the quad, raise up. Same as everything else, typically do three to five second hold, three to five reps each side and then do more or less based on how I'm feeling that day, individual needs and all that good stuff. All right guys, so that kind of wraps that up again, just to review some of those things. Obviously I'm explaining them a little bit more as I go through, so some of them may be even a little bit longer, shorter, but hopefully you get a feel that if you're doing three to five second holds for three to five reps, even when you're doing alternating sides, each one doesn't generally take more than a minute or two minutes to go each side. Um, so again, in between warm up sets, I think is the absolute best way to go because then technically it doesn't take any additional time. So what the hell is the point of all this stuff? Well, one, I always say in the dumb, dumb version of what I've learned from some smart neurophys guys. So again, neurophys, I always say in the neuromuscular junction, you've got the muscle side, you've got the brain side. I tend to focus on the muscle side, neurophys guys focus on the brain side. But things need to happen on the brain side for you to have max contractions and max output. And basically what you need to have, have need to have happen is repetitions. Um, and so again, all that means is if you went right into the gym and went right under your max weight for your max set, you probably wouldn't be able to do it. Even aside from getting injured, it's hard to call upon the amount of output that you want from a muscular side. So what do you need to have that happen? Contractions. Can that happen with warm-up sets? Yes, absolutely. So doing warm-up sets, that's half the point, even more so than getting injured. What I have found doing this type of stuff is it also demands contractions from all the muscles that are involved. So it helps prep you for a higher level of output. At the same time, it's actually less fatiguing um, and less overall volume. And even though people don't typically think about warm up sets as volume, the longer you do this, I'm gonna tell you anywhere you can spare volume, the better. So typically what I found with myself and my athletes is whatever you would normally do, if it's normally five or six warm up sets, maybe for your first big movement, and you normally do X amount of reps, normally you can cut the volume in half and have the same level of uh, performance, the same feel, um, the same level of preparedness, 
if not more, having done some stuff with the individual joints, while only done a little bit of fatigue using body weight stuff and doing isometrics, not nearly as fatiguing as a heavy bar on your back. You know, so one, it's a way to prepare your body for a higher amount of output. In my opinion, that's less fatiguing than doing the exercise in and of itself. Some of the other reasons, this is probably the number one most important reason, is I think the biggest thing that people, people always look for, what's the best mobility program? What's the best thing I can do to keep flexible, to gain flexibility, to not have injuries? Um, people look at, you know, bodybuilders or people that train for a long time, they say, oh, they get muscle bound. It's because of their training that they're muscle bound or they can't move. I'll tell you what, I've worked with general population for 10 years prior to working with meatheads. And the same thing that happens to meatheads happens to general population. Everybody loses mobility and loses range of motion over the course of your life. Why does that happen? People just stop using it. You don't think about how much it is where, again, normal people, I always, I've worked with so many people in their 60s, their 70s, their 80s, that are literally incapable of reaching their arm up and grabbing stuff off the top shelf. And again, some of theirs, of course, bone things, osteoporosis, osteopenia, completely separate thing. But some people, their range of motion gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And as you stop using stuff, you really do lose it. You don't use it, you lose it. That, that saying actually has a high level of accuracy. So a lot of meatheads, bodybuilders, they just do a lot of this, they do a lot of this, and they never call upon having to go back here, completely externally rotate, internally rotate, whatever it is. So just having some habit that makes you go through the full range of motion that you currently have available is the best thing that you can do to preserve the range of motion that you currently have available. And in, from my experience, expand it. If you go to like, I'm doing the straight leg hip flexion there, working on people say have tight hamstrings. If you do that every single, t every single week, multiple times a week, lots of times people have more flexible hamstrings are better at hip flexion. So again, working in those end ranges, one, I think it's the most important thing you can do to preserve range of motion, very realistic thing. Now, obviously, um, some of the stuff stems, or I've been doing a lot of this stuff for a while. Some of it stems from some FRC stuff. So if you look at the Functional Anatomy Seminars group, they have some very good information on this. Some of their things are awesome, but some of it's like, hey, do this stuff for an hour every day or do this stuff for a half an hour every day. And it's like, I'm not going to do that. So if I just have some habit that I do every single time before I train, sometimes every single time after I train, I think it's the best, most efficient way that you can actually maintain range of motion that you have and sometimes expand it. Again, I can speak from client experience, personal experience. I'm a pretty mobile guy. And half of it is just because I've consistently done this stuff always around my training in some way, shape or form. Um, and then on top of that, I think a lot of it's great inventory. So people say, well, why would I squat or this and that? Who knows why, but everyone's trained at some point in time, a knee doesn't feel good, an ankle doesn't feel good, a hip doesn't feel good. Sometimes you don't find those things until your top sets, which is not a great place to find them. So I honestly like to look at this as inventory. Can I actually call upon these muscles to contract? Can I move this joint through this range of motion? And sometimes I find something, again, I'll use my left ankle as an example, it doesn't move. Lots of times when I put more time and effort into moving it, I'll get more range of motion out of the workouts and feel better when I train. Sometimes it won't. And again, this is probably maybe you know, one out of 50 times for me, I'll have something that doesn't feel great when I start to move it and continues to not feel great the entire session. So that's the first me taking inventory prior to training and saying, okay, well, maybe today is not the day to just blast through this and, you know, wreck my ankle, wreck my knee, wreck whatever it is. And again, that's coming from experience. That's coming from just having worked through stuff and not finding stuff till top sets. Whereas I come here, I can just kind of, again, take inventory of the joints I'm going to use, the muscles I'm going to use and say, really, should I push it today? Is my body ready to do what it is? And again, if you actually train hard, for me, it rarely, rarely happens. You know, if you're just looking for excuses not to train hard, you're gonna say, oh, this doesn't feel good and talk yourself out of training, in which case you'd be doing that prior to this. But again, for those individuals that really train hard and know that one messed up session can mess up weeks or months of training, you wanna have something again to just kind of check the boxes before you go, okay, I'm ready, okay, I'm prepped. Um, and so again, that's some of the stuff I love to do with that. I think, again, it's the best prevention you can have to still be able to move good, to feel good, to remain flexible or mobile or whatever you want to call it. And then again, I think it's just an efficient way to warm up, an efficient way to prep, an efficient way to basically take inventory of what you have going on that day. And again, a huge thing that people are missing is yes, you have to have progressive overload. Yes, you have to do log books. You got to check your boxes. You have to show some documentable, you know, quantitative progress. Otherwise, you know, there's no way to know if you're making progress. But at the same time, people have to be mindful. Most people need to be more mindful when they train. Instead of just moving from A to B, actually thinking about the muscles you're training, trying to make it as hard as you can on the muscles you're training. So mentally, I always like these preps too, is getting my brain in the gym. I think I'm the same as a lot of people. I've got business, I've got kids, I've got my wife, I've got every billion things outside the gym constantly going. And I'll come in the gym sometime literally with every single thing in my brain. I'm not at a point in my life anymore where I can just you know turn stuff off and have my day revolve around the gym. It doesn't work like that. 
So I like something that takes this external world stuff and has me start focusing internally, internally on my muscles, my joints and all that. And by the time I'm ever done with warm up sets and going through all that stuff, mentally, I always feel way more clicked on, way more ready to actually train. And that's coming from being completely honest. There's tons of times I'm walking in the gym, I'm not feeling it. I mean, it's great when I was in my teens or in my 20s and my entire thing was either just being a personal training and training or just being in college and eating, sleeping, drinking and training. Um, but again, now I have a lot of stuff going on. So there's lots of times I walk in and I'm not feeling it. And having this as part of my ritual always kind of clicks me in and gets me ready to go. So that's as short as I can keep some of the ex explanations behind why I like this stuff. Honestly, there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, but again, this is similar to something that I would do um, pretty much almost any time before lower body day. I said this briefly when going through it is I, I, this is not an exact thing. Sometimes I'll do more for a joint. Sometimes I'll do less. Sometimes I'll sub something in, sometimes I'll sub something out. If I'm in a hurry, same as everybody else, or if I'm just impatient and grumpy and like, I don't feel like rolling around on the floor, then maybe I'll just do one or two. So again, this isn't like, I do this perfect every single time. So many things in life are, again, if you can do something consistently and adhere to it for long periods of time, anything is better than nothing. You know, it's like, oh, I'm gonna brush my teeth, you know, three times a day for a whole week and then fall off, or I'm just gonna brush my teeth twice a day, you know, for my entire life is probably better than ups and downs, ups and downs. Um, so anyway, if you guys like this stuff, shameless plug. It's not shameless because I'm very proud of it. Um, I have a, an ebook that I made called The Mobile Meathead. I'm pretty just proud of that name in and of itself. Just let that marinate. The Mobile Meathead. Damn, that's good. Um, but anyway, it's much more detailed than this. There's a whole section that actually really breaks down a lot of the thought process, a lot of the why, who is this for, all that kind of stuff. And it gives you routines to follow before every single session. So before a chest day, a push day, a pull day, a lower body day, what routine would you follow exactly the same? And all of them are just like this. They take five minutes tops. And then I give you stuff after the session if you wanna do some extra homework as well too. So there are times I do more corrective -y type work, which is very similar things, but sometimes involving some load, some stronger contractions, and the same thing after every single body part. Um, so again, not everybody needs this stuff. Not everybody's into this stuff, but if you want a more in-depth look at it, a little bit deeper of an understanding, and something you can follow before and after every single session you have in the gym. That's what that ebook's for. And honestly, I'm really proud of it. It's got a lot of great information. It's like, I don't, I'm going to misquote, somewhere between 50 and 100 pages. It's a beast. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Every single one of the um, little demos has like a video with it. So it's an exercise library. Here's how you do this one, walking you through it, aside from just an overview of how it looks. Um, so it's a badass ebook. So we're going to link it somewhere up here. If Trevor didn't already link it up here somewhere, I'll put it down in the bio down below. I'm going to put it everywhere. If you can't find it, you don't deserve the program anyway. So anyway, whether you ever get an ebook from me or not, I still love you. Thank you for watching this whole video. You are a trooper. If you didn't already, like, subscribe, do all that. And of course, just continue to take all my free stuff. Again, if you never give me a dollar, that's cool too. I'm happy to help give you guys some good info. Give this a go, your next leg day. Try some of it, try all of it. And I promise you just this, you will feel a difference. And once you do it, come back. Leave me some feedback in the comment section about how glorious your body is moving, that you feel like some sort of like gazelle just going like full speed through the Sahara, safari, wherever gazelles go, being chased by lions, but less, like more relaxing, not being chased by a lion, just going for a gazelle jog, feeling good, feeling mobile. All right, that's my sign off. Let's leave this as awkward as possible. I'm done with this video now. Bye-bye.